Good evening. My name is Lori Zabata, and I'm a proud JWU alumna and the Director of Alumni Relations at Johnson & Wales University. Thank you for joining us for today's session titled Sip with JWU, 10 Things You Didn't Know About Rosé. We are excited to bring this program to you virtually and look forward to this walkthrough of the history, styles, tasting, and pairing notes of this great summer wine. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. With the exception of the presenters, all participants have been muted. Please leave your cameras turned off until the tasting portion of the presentation. When directed, if you'd like to turn your camera on, please do so. If you'd like to ask a question, please do so in the chat feature. We will refer to the section to take questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Set your view to speaker view in the top right corner of your screen. This will be the best way to see our presenter. During the presentation portion, we suggest selecting show small active speaker video as the view, which is the middle option on the top left of the menu items. I'd like to thank the alumni relations team for their help behind the scenes of today's session, especially Lauren Anderson, manager of alumni relations for her work to bring this program to us. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Sarah Malik. She's an associate professor in food service management at the JWU Charlotte campus. Her areas of expertise include beverage appreciation, hospitality systems, restaurant management, and wine and spirits education. Originally from the United Kingdom, Sarah studied institutional management and hotel catering at Manchester Metropolitan University and has an MBA from Oxford Brookes University. She worked for Hilton International and Queens Moat Houses as a food and beverage director and Bass Charrington Breweries and West Midland Taverns as a general manager. Studying in Switzerland with Don Smith and the pioneering menu engineering program for a summer developed into a five year assignment where she was involved in educating students in hotel management. As a visiting professor at the JWU Providence campus, she realized that was where she wanted to settle and raise her family. Sarah worked as a general manager running two hotels in New England and then returned to JWU where she has worked for 20 years as a wine and spirits educator. She received teacher of the year in 2004. Sarah is a Wine Spirit Education Trust Diploma Merit Recipient and a member of the Society of Wine Educators, where she has earned Certified Specialist of Wine, Certified Specialist of Spirits, and the Certified Wine Educator Awards. Sarah has also earned a diploma from the International Sommelier Guild and has been part of the Banfi Wine Education Program and the Napa Valley Wine Academy. Sarah regularly appears on television presenting segments on wines and spirits. She has also presented at the Society of Wine Educators Conference and BevCon discussing the English sparkling wine revolution. We are so grateful to have her and her level of knowledge at JWU, and I'm thrilled to have her with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Professor Malik. So hi everybody, um, I apologize for the technology. I haven't been teaching <laughs> since March um, and I sound a little verklempt and it's actually because I'm looking at all these names popping up of students that I've taught and I feel like, oh my God, this is so emotional. So welcome to uh, the students that I've taught and to any alumni that have signed in this presentation this evening. Um, I'm really excited to share some information with you. Um, I'm going to just share a few things with you about um, rosé wine, um, and then we're going to do some tasting. But by all means, start tasting. I mean, it's 25 to 6, and I'm sure some of you maybe, um, you know, have already tried the wine that you bought already. Um, I've actually got quite a few wines here um, that I'm going to sort of uh, show you, um, and hopefully we'll just gain a little bit of knowledge about um, some rosés, uh, 10 things please don't keep record there might be eight there might be 11 i don't know but hopefully this will um you know give you a better perspective on rosé so i'm just going to share this excuse me while i put my glasses on um and what i'm going to do is just share my um presentation with you and then we can get started okay so I know it's been difficult over the last um, few months and I'm really glad to do rosé when I was actually asked to do this I thought I've got to do something that's positive and happy um, and when can wine you know not be that it's actually probably saved a lot of us over the last uh, few months 
Um, just to give you some information here, this is probably not shocking to some of you, um, but you know, I think all of us, due to stresses that we've had in our family, um, have certainly um, looked at opening bottles of wine at five o'clock in the afternoon to really help us. Um, but having a look here at some of these statistics, you can see that certainly um, sales of wine boomed. Um, but what's quite interesting is box wine. And I actually held my hand up. I um, used to drink box wine when I was a student um, and progressed into bottles. Um, but now, um, you know, I certainly um, looked at alternatives to just be a little bit more budget conscious and also to the fact that perhaps we were drinking wine more than maybe twice a, uh, twice a week. Um, so you can see um, wine sales certainly went up. Beer sales did come down, which is kind of amazing because usually in the United States, and if anybody's not in the United States, it'd be interesting to hear how other countries' um, beverage sales were. Um, but usually beer goes through the roof, but it did not this time. Wine actually went through the roof. And um, something that is, you know, I suppose it's a lot to do with uh, marketing is the canned uh, cocktails uh, boomed considerably. Um, but canned rosé, uh, which I do know, I, I live in a neighborhood with some very young moms, and at three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, they were a little concerned. It looked a bit, um, I suppose, unmotherly to stand there with a bottle of wine. So they had cans, little cans of rosé. So you can see here, 95% increase. We mustn't lose sight. It's a very positive time. I have a lot of students that work in off-premise um, and, you know, wine shops, record sales, you know, liquor shops, record sales. But what we have to remember here is a lot of the small businesses, especially, this has hit them really hard. And I know a lot of my friends who own restaurants have really put good price points in for their wines. So next time you buy a bottle of wine, you know, just think about when you're doing your, uh, picking up your delivery of uh, food, you know, maybe tag on a little bottle of wine. Um, yes, this is quite uh, embarrassing, really. But, it, you know, COVID, I suppose, started when this, you know, it was a little bit warmer. Um, and you can see here um, in March, April, uh, the increase in the consumption of rosé was absolutely through the roof. Um, and I suppose um, a lot of it is to do with the fact that a lot of people, you know, do prefer red. I mean, that's a fact. Most people do prefer drinking red to actually drinking um, white. And I think what we saw here was people kind of looking at sort of the middle road. Um, and so what we can see is, um, oh my gosh, 413, 679% increase, which, you know, is incredible. Um, for those of you that are in the United States, and for those of you that are not in the United States, um, if you just take a look at this image, you can see here, it's quite interesting to see, and no surprise on the top right-hand corner, um, that women certainly um, are more, in, I suppose, inclined to drink wine than men. This doesn't mean to say that men don't drink at all, it's just that women tend to, it tends to be their drink of choice. Um, I quite like the frequency and the all-American adults because I lie when I go to the doctors. So I'm sure most of us, when they say how many drinks of, you know, glasses of wine do you have a week and you say two, um, hoping they're not going to ask, you know, a night or a week. But you can see here that 49% regularly drink wine um, and the high frequency and occasional, I'm not quite sure we should really pay attention to that too much. What is quite interesting, and I've done quite a lot of studies on this, is the millennials. They tend to be the sort of, you know, the, I'm a boomer, um, and I think we're sort of, we've already sort of set our uh, path with wine drinking. But what's quite interesting is we, we see the millennials are um, certainly a big wine drinkers. They're, they're, they always have been. Um, we can see here the Gen Z um, and even young, you know, obviously in America it's 21, but the Gen Z are a little bit more confusing for the marketing um, companies. That we don't know really what they drink. Sometimes they drink beer, sometimes craft, domestic. Um, they're a little hard to figure out, but certainly the millennials do drive um, the wine industry here in the United States. Now, rosé has always been a fantastic option, certainly when the weather gets warmer, um, and we have seen colossal increases, um, certainly um, over the last decade. And even though it has slowed a little bit, there's no question that we have certainly seen um, much more of a, a, a 
just a little slower um, pace, people are still buying it and still drinking it. And you'll probably be quite fascinated a minute to sort of see what people are actually drinking. Um, in the United States, um, if you look at the right hand side, certainly um, from 2017 to 2019, 2017 obviously pale pink, 2019 uh, the darker pink, you can see that that has definitely in two years been incredibly, uh, has, has increased you know, quite a, a fast pace. Um, whereas in France, which is also you know, one of the biggest rosé con uh, consumers in the uh, world, they've actually it's sort of depleted a little bit. They've actually slowed down a little bit on their rosé. Um, and, you know, I always get fascinated by um, is rosé a female or is it a male? I mean, it never really crossed my mind until I read a lot about rosé um, and this phenomenon which really came about in the last few years, which is men drinking rosé. And, you know, how does it make me look standing here with a you know, beautiful glass of um, pink wine? Um, and you can see that certainly um, if you look at the countries here, um, France, China, Belgium, even the, you know, the UK, if you have a look, then certainly women do tend to drink more rosé than men. But then, I don't know about Brazil, but Brazil's looking extremely, uh, men seem to be way, way ahead of women uh, drinking rosé. And here in the United States, um, Russia and Australia, we see sort of a, an equal amount. I think that's also got a lot to do with when we kind of go out, um, you know, we get a bottle of wine, women tend to be a little bit more dominant. And it's like, this is what we're going to drink, and you're going to drink it. Um, so it is quite fascinating to see that gender difference, if you like. And as I said to you before, you know, it really is a cultural, um, it, not even, you know, we're a continent. It's very hard to make a generalization about America because, you know, I've lived in the Northeast and I've lived in the, you know, the Southeast and I know some of you are on the West Coast. You know, even getting down to sort of into the state and having a look at counties, people drink very, very differently. So it's very um, naive or, you know, just to say, oh, everybody drinks red because yes, it is very popular and it is uh, yeah. really, um, you know, one of the most important colored wines. Um, but you can see here um, that white wine, 65% and then rosé, 55 So it's sort of dislike, like, dislike, like. I mean, certainly I know people that hate rosé and hate red. They love white. They love sweet white. They don't like dry white. So it's a very personal thing. One thing that I wanted to go with you, through with you, and, and certainly in a minute when I sort of take the PowerPoint off and we start tasting, is I'll go through with you really about tasting because it isn't as complicated as people make out. But a lot of people say to me, they really don't think they can taste the difference between a cheap wine and an expensive wine. Well, you should come to my class. In fact, you know what? I'm going to film it week one. My students, when we pour very inexpensive wines because we want to just help them understand acidity or tannin or sugar. And I just get very inexpensive wine and pour it and they're very happy. Um, week 10, after they've gone through European countries and California and Washington State and Chile and Argentina and tasted some very good quality wines, when we get to sort of about three months into the course, it's amazing how their palates have changed. And if I do give them something that is perhaps not such great quality, they let me know. Um, so to say that perhaps in a blind tasting, you wouldn't know whether something is good quality or not is really incorrect because I think all of us do know. Um, and if, if you gain, if you have a look here, millennials, not so confident, but the Gen X are there. They are, yep, I got it. I kind of can tell the difference between a $5 bottle and a $100 bottle. But that's something that I'll share with you in a minute. And there's a few little tips that I'll give you so you can actually figure it out and actually figure out, is this wine good quality or not? One of the things that can be a little confusing with rosé is the complete gamut of colour. I mean, it is so difficult sometimes when you're actually tasting um, rosé, when you're looking at it, excuse me, and you're trying to define what colour it is. Because I know a lot of you um, have done wine certifications and you've studied wine and you've looked at, you know, wine templates. And sometimes they always give you these sort of colours that don't match the wine, you know. So you sometimes go, you have to write down these descriptors for the rosé 
but sometimes they're really, really hard to do because sometimes they look a little orange, sometimes they look a little bit pink, cerise, red. I mean, so really it can be quite difficult to figure out. What I did was, even though we're gonna, I'm gonna just focus on two, I wanted to really show you um, how you can get something that is super pale, um, you know, like the Van Gris, which I'll show you on the slide, right through to wines that technically look like red and perhaps just don't have that pigment or that power of color, um, that pinkness, that it's just got much more powerful. And really, it's fascinating to kind of go back in history and to try and figure out how all these things occurred and how did this wine suddenly, you know, be called rosé. Um, and a lot of it was really just to do with, you can go back to Bordeaux, for example, and Bordeaux, most of you have tried Bordeaux wines and they're very powerful with Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot and Cab Franc and Malbec. And what we saw here was a, a part of the world that doesn't necessarily get great weather. So sometimes these grapes would not ripen and you wouldn't get this phenolic ripeness. And so unfortunately that translated into very light colored wine, which I'm sure some of you've heard, which is claret, or as the British call it, claret, which is kind of tricky to get hold of here in the United States. But if you do actually go to Bordeaux, France, you'll actually be able to see it. And it literally looks like rosé, but it isn't. It's just very, very light red. So I'll just go through with you how they make rosé. Nothing technical. I'm just going to show you an example and tell you how they do it. Um, and it really is very, very straightforward. You'll see here there are really four methods. There's really three, but I've just been a little pedantic tonight because I'm in the presence of obviously very talented wine people and I just want to make sure that um, uh, I'm being thorough. Um, direct press, maceration, saigne, which means bleeding, and of course, blending. So what we'll do here is I just go back to direct press. This is probably a really good example of a direct press. Um, and you can see here, it is so pale. What you want from a rosé is you want acid. You want a vibrant, acidic, fresh fruit, not necessarily sweet, even though there are sweet rosés out there. It would feel very strange if you kind of tasted this wine and it was sort of very flat and no acidity and, and it didn't taste how it looked. So you have to sometimes think that when people or when winemakers make rosé, they actually make it like white wine. They kind of keep a much cooler temperature. Um, so we really do think about rosé as white wine. So with this one, what you're looking at here is just getting the whole bunches off the vine and you're just pressing it super, super gently and getting this lovely pale color out of it. What you really don't want, if you think about it, is the skin of the grape gives you that really, a lot of that mouth drying sensation, the tannin, the astringency that you get in red wine. So really what you're trying to do is not allow this to really get into something like this. When you're describing the wine, and I'll mention it now, so when we do the tasting, if, any, if I do forget to tell you, is generally when a wine is like this in color, it usually will smell and taste of things like melon, grapefruit, which sounds strange because those are sort of descriptors for white wine, but actually it is perfectly fine to say this about a direct press or in this example here, this Gris Blanc um, that actually comes from the south of France. Um, and you, you can see here, it's just, it would be very typical uh, for you to smell and taste this and go, oh, if, if you did it blind, I mean, if you put it into a black sort of glass or you perhaps wore a blindfold, you would probably think this would be a white wine. Very typical of the south of France. Something else that's very typical, of course, is this just quintessential. And I'm so glad that some of you have bought these Provence wines because they're lovely. If any of you listened to NPR this morning, it was heartbreaking because they've made so much rosé in Provence that they can't sell it because of obviously restaurants not purchasing it and import duties, export arguments that are going on in the world as we speak. So the French government said they would buy a lot of this Provence rosé for a dollar equivalent if you like and turn it into hand sanitizer so 
you know, it, and so they asked the question, well, would, you know, could you not sell it? And she was like, no, I can't keep it because it's wine that isn't really to be aged. Um, and unfortunately she had to unload it. So at least she perhaps broke even. So it was, you know, kind of a, it is a strange world. So maceration really means that you're kind of getting the grapes off the bunch. Um, you're pressing them. You're getting, you, sometimes you'll find in Provence, they may soak it for two hours. They may soak it for 72. Um, there are some parts of the world that soak it for much longer. And you're not fermenting here. You're just macerating. You're like soaking these grapes and trying to get as much color as you can out of them. But again, you don't want too much color. You don't want to have too much phenolic in that wine. Once you've actually macerated and got as much, I suppose, color, if you like, and flavor out of these grapes, you can then separate the juice from this sort of must, which is the flesh, the pips, the skins, and then just ferment as you would accordingly. So a little bit more maceration than perhaps the first wine, but again, very much con um, temperature controlled, hugely controlled. Well, I actually went to a, a webinar this week and it was about Seignet and uh, it was some of the Provence, in fact, it was the gentleman that owns, that makes this Gris Blanc. And he goes, this is the worst way of making rosé. He said, it's just the people that make red wine and then bleed some off to make rosé and to try and make more money. So he was very scathing about it. Basically, yeah, I suppose he's right. If you're making red wine and everybody's drinking rosé, you get the color out of the grapes that were technically on their way to make red and you just bleed it off. You'll see on that first slide here, you just bleed, Seigneur's French for bleeding, bleed off a little bit and make rosé. There's nothing wrong with trying to expand your portfolio, but he was very, very scathing. I would like to interject though, there's some very old French wines, for example, Tavel and some of the Loire rosés that actually use this method. So yeah, he was, he was, he was probably right in one way, but it is, a, it is a method. What you're going to notice here with Seignier is they're going to use grapes that have typically were heading towards red. So Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Syrah, you know, Morvedre. So sometimes what you're going to see in Seignier wine is certainly a much richer color, certainly a little bit more bite phenolic wise, and certainly more redder fruit. I think what you can safely say is possibly even black fruit. So you can, you can see how this has changed somewhat. The final one, of course, is blending. Now, yeah, I could take you and show you a very cheap Moscato for $3 from Walmart, and there's nothing wrong with that, pink Moscato, but we all know that Moscato technically doesn't make pink Moscato. Um, so a lot of the time you'll notice that some will just pop in some red and put it into the, um, the white wine to make it pink. Probably the most famous classy quality driven wine is champagne, where they actually do put in um, some Pinot Noir at the very beginning. So just a few suggestions for rosés for you to try. Um, and as I say, this is recorded, so you'll be able to look at it later on. Um, but some of the ones that I've tried lately that I love, um, Greece, um, again, to counteract the heat, they do put their vines much higher up. Um, where it's a lot cooler, the higher up you go, the cooler it gets. And certainly surrounded by water, you're gonna get a lot of ocean breezes. But this particular wine from Domaine Scrasse is absolutely beautiful, Peplo, if you ever come across it. I also wanted to mention here about Southern France, um, you can see Gérard Bertrand, and I'm not, I think you might, if you, if you look at the far right, what he actually does have, um, his Clos de Temple, is actually $125. So don't think that rosés are all $10 to $12 because there's certainly, there's, a, there's definitely a much higher level of rosés that are available. I'm sure some of you've tried this. This is one of my favorites, Chacoli or Chacoli from the Basque region of Spain. It has a little bit of effervescence in it. Absolutely fantastic. Um, you don't pay more than maybe $20 and it's really fascinating. The grapes are a little bit hard to pronounce. Um, Honda Rabi Belza, but really fun wine. And then don't forget to try other rosés apart from Provence. Loire Valley makes some of the most beautiful rosés in France. 
And if you want to really expand and impress some of your dinner guests, you can certainly have a look. And some out there are just phenomenal. Slovenia is making phenomenal rosés from Blau Frankish. Um, Pet Nat, you know, naturally sparkling. And Sicily, phenomenal rosés are coming out of that, of that particular island as well. And again, you may think, well, Sicily is you know super super southerly and hot but again because it's a lot of it is elevated on the volcano and surrounded by water you actually do end up getting some beautiful acidity in the wine as well as rich fruit aromas and flavors and so what we have here just to sort of show you the final parts of the presentation is some of the predictions for rosé this has already been launched prosecco Prosecco is white, it's made from a grape called Glera, and they have started putting a little bit of Pinot Noir into it and turning it into pink Prosecco. So keep an eye out, this is definitely one that is going to be a big seller, absolutely globally. Rosé flavoured spirits. Gin is on the market now, you can get rosé flavoured, um, rosé uh, tonic waters. Canned rosés we know, and also rosé adjunct. What I mean here is you can get things like um, sour beers with rosé wine in them. So a little bit of hybrid going on. And just keep an eye out um, for rosé all year, we know that, is some of the higher end rosés. Um, I know that Whispering Angel is crazy popular, um, and Moet Hennessy, um, Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy's um, Wine and Spirit branch has just actually acquired Chateau Esclin that actually makes Whispering Angels. So I think you're going to see quite a lot of certainly very high-end rosés out there like Clos de Temple. To finish off here, we've got some celebrity brands, um, which I'll show you. Um, I actually purchased um, one for us to share today um, from Post Malone. Um, so I'll taste it and tell you what I think of it. Um, but just a couple of slides here, you'll see um, pretty, pretty cells. Um, this is actually uh, Wolfer Estate, which any of you are, who are up in, um, up in New York, in Long Island, this is a phenomenal um, bottle uh, to look at. Um, and surprisingly, uh, has Chardonnay and Gewurztraminer in it. So everything you think about rosé just being from grapes that make red wine or, you know, black skin grapes is completely wrong. This one actually uses um, grapes that are set to make white wine. So yes, a lot of people have been very scathing about Post Malone, but credit to him. He went to Provence and he actually spent a year learning about wine and learning how to make wine. And this wine is actually fabulous. 50,000 bottles sold out straight away. Um, but here in Charlotte, one of my friends who owns a wine shop um, actually carries it and he put two bottles aside for me. So I'm going to try that in a minute, which is his uh, Maison uh, Neuf. Of course, you have seen probably Sarah Jessica Parker's. Um, there are so many celebrities out there. The sad mirror valve with um, Brangelina. Um, and that's really up to you. There's a lot of articles out there where you can actually taste these rosés and really kind of decide what you think. Um, is it sort of just another way of making money or are they really producing some you know, good wine? This is on the horizon as well. I don't think I need to explain it. You can just look at the picture, but this is definitely something that is up and coming. And I quite like this one. I don't know what you think, but this is a scratch and sniff, which is insane. So you can imagine, obviously not gonna to work too well at the moment, but this label would require you just to scratch it and you can smell what the wine typically would smell and taste like. And for those of us on a budget, um, you can certainly head to Walmart and you can actually get this little cocktail mixer, which is rosé wine, drink enhancer, and pop it in. So uh, no, there's no alcohol. You can just pop it into perhaps a, a cheap bottle of white wine. And then don't forget our little box wine. It'd be interesting to see how many of you have actually been drinking this box wine. So I think it's time to taste. So what you can do is if any of you wish to put your cameras on, please do. It'd be great to see everybody. I, don't, I won't get emotional. Um, and then what I'm going to do is just go through a little tasting with you. So, excuse me, I'm going to put my glasses on. 
Okay. Hey, Abigail. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things that um, when we're talking about tasting is um, we really do three things. We're, we're kind of looking at the wine, we're smelling the wine, and we're tasting the wine. And then we kind of come into a conclusion. Um, I know that some people um, over the last few months, this is the last thing people have wanted to do is um, start analyzing wine. Um, but really, it is something that, you know, it, it's a good way to do it. It makes you kind of systematically go through things and come to a conclusion on is this good quality? Is it ready to drink? So what I'll do is let me, um, I'm going to do Mr. Malone's wine. I'm going to use his um, for, an, for a uh, sample. It's beautiful. It has a, um, it had a little glass stopper in it. Super cute. It was about $20, so that's not too bad. Um, and it actually has had some quite good reviews. So I'll, let's see what it's all about. So the first thing you would do when you're actually systematically going through a tasting is you want to make sure that your wine looks healthy. So when you pour a white wine, it should look white. When you pour a red, it should look red. And if you pour a rosé, yeah, it should look rosé. But there are many different sort of color parameters that um, sh you know people are trying at the moment, orange wine, unfiltered wine. So this can be quite confusing when you're actually looking at it. But what you want to do is actually look for sort of it to be healthy. Um, and often when you're looking at a wine, this will tell you a little bit about its age. We're talking about rosé and most rosés are to be drunk one year, two years, the, unless you're really getting something that has maybe got um, you know, alcohol, acid, and tannin, which are sort of things that will help a wine age, then really these wines are not to be kept for, you know, long living. These are to be drunk. I mean, most wine, if you probably are aware, 96% of the wine that gets purchased is actually drunk within 24 hours. Um, and so it's quite frightening to think that people, you know, literally don't even probably put it under their stairs for a rainy day. It's, it's consumed. So going back to your rosé, I know a lot of you have purchased rosés, so there's going to be lots and lots of different colours. You're going to get things like pinks, um, as I said to you, oranges, salmon, cerise. Um, and what we tend to do is we sort of look at the intensity, um, and the intensity is how powerful is that particular colour. So when you actually look at this wine, to me, this looks like peach. It has a little kind of peachy colour to it. A um, little bit of orange, a little bit of pink. Um, and usually what I do, I mean, with whites and rosés, you don't necessarily need to do it. With reds, you can do it. It's sort of putting your hand behind it or sort of looking down. And if you can see the stem, it will give it its sort of intensity. If you can't see your hand or you can't see the stem, then it would sort of be a deep intensity. But when you're actually comparing these two wines, you can see here that this one is a very, very pale intensity of color. And this one is certainly more of a medium intensity. This one, I mean, it is like a little dusky pink. I think it's like pale, dusty pink. And I think this one here would sort of be a, like a medium salmon peach color. Again, I don't want to spend too much time really going through this because to be honest, rosé is just to be enjoyed. But let's smell it. If you have your wine, which I'm sure you do, you just need to pick up the glass and smell it. Give it a good swirl. Rosé should be served chilled, but if you serve it too cold, then you're going to lose a lot of the aroma and flavour. So I would chill mine, and then I just bring it out and leave it on the counter for about an hour before I drink it. And then you're still going to have it nice and chilled. What you're going to do here, put your nose to the glass. If you have to really put your nose in, then you're going to find that this wine would sort of be a much not so powerful, like a light intensity on the nose. If you kind of leave your nose at the top and you can smell the aromas, then maybe a medium intensity. If you can literally pour it and you're smelling it, then it's probably going to be quite pronounced. So this particular wine, um, definitely a sort of medium, medium plus intensity, and it smells amazing. Post Malone has not paid me to say this. I don't think he needs to. Um, this is it smells just so refreshing. It smells like cantaloupe. And it has these lovely sort of wild strawberry and raspberry um, 
just fantastic. It just reminds me of summer. It smells so beautiful. Um, I love the aroma. It, it can sometimes be disappointing when things smell good and then you taste them and it doesn't follow through. But at the moment, it smells fantastic. When you taste a wine, you want to swirl it, really swish it around your mouth, kind of like mouthwash, and really think about it. Where does it attack you? What you're going to notice with rosés is they have lots of acidity, and acidity tends to grab you on the side of your tongue. You tend to also get a lot of saliva building up under your tongue. You really want to try and get that, um, I suppose it's sort of like the spit test in a way. You've got it in your mouth and you think to yourself, well, yes, this has got a lot of water. Or, yeah, and this is a very high acid, but it's certainly going to be like kind of sucking a lemon, if you like. And that's the acidity. Don't worry about thinking about tannins or any mouth drying sensations in rosé. You really don't need to worry about it. And sometimes we talk about the body as well, which is the weight. How does it feel on your tongue? Is it sort of like skim milk or 1%, 2%? It's sort of the body. And the body is often related to alcohol. The weightier it is in your mouth usually parallels with the alcohol. Full-bodied wines tend to have high alcohol. But most importantly with rosé, what you want to do is take a big sip, swish it around your mouth and see what flavors you can actually get from it. Breathing air in, I had to swallow it because I'm talking, but, and what you're gonna do is just think about the message that's sort of left in your palate. With this particular wine, it really has everything that I smelled. So I'm getting lots and lots of fresh fruit, just zinging out, lots of red fruit, peaches, apricots even, and certainly that cantaloupe is still there. So when you're actually looking at it, smelling it, tasting it, what you can kind of come to a conclusion is, you know, is this good quality? And let me try and explain that, how you do that. There's a little mnemonic that I use, which is called BLIC, B-L-I-C, so it's easy to remember. B stands for balance, L stands for length, I stands for intensity, and C stands for complexity. If your wine checks all four boxes, then it would be outstanding. If it checks all three boxes, it would be very good. If it checked two, it would be good. If it checked one, it would be acceptable. So really what you've got to try and do is think about, go back to balance. And what balance means is really just everything in that, on, certainly on the palate more than anything, the balance of the acidity, the body, the sort of, fruit that you're getting out of this wine. Possibly, if you were talking about red wine, you'd be talking about tannin. The dryness, something that I did not mention, but most of these rosés are going to be under nine grams a litre. Provence has a law of under four grams a litre, which means totally and utterly dry. But if all these things seem to be in balance, like nothing stands out, then you could check that box. Length, is how long is it hanging around? This wine, I can still taste it after 30, 40 seconds. So this has a good length. There are some rosés though out there that you take a sip and it just disappears. There's no flavor, there's no nothing in your mouth staying behind to give you a little conversation. This is still here. So for me, this wine has great length. Nice balance, great length. Now, the intensity was going back to what I said to you before. When I smelt it and when I tasted it, I said to you, how powerful is it on the nose and how powerful on the palate? When I actually smelt this wine, I sort of said to you, it's sort of a medium intensity. It sort of goes light, medium pronounced. And this was sort of in the middle, but still really good, medium plus intensity. On the palate, I would say this, the intensity of this wine was definitely up there, medium plus even pronounced. So I really think this has maybe half a check of intensity. And then complexity is really the descriptions that you've used. And be very, very careful about this because sometimes people go red fruit. Now that's okay between you and me. I won't mark you wrong. If you were in my class, you would be marked wrong. Um, because what we're looking at here is we have clusters or categories of fruits, like citrus fruits or red fruits or black fruits or spices. 
And what you have to do then is break that down and tell me exactly what it is. So is it a raspberry? Is it a strawberry? I mean, you can get really pedantic and say, okay, what type of raspberry? Is it underripe, ripe? You know, it can get really crazy. I'm sure some of you have seen this um, in tastings. The more you write, and really with sort of wine tasting that we do in a, I think most human beings can't really pick up more than four aromas or four flavors in their palate, even though people say, oh, to be a master psalm or a master of wine, we've got to write nine. Hell, I would make those things up because really what you're talking about here is the human body can only really cope with about four or five. But if you've written about four or five aromas and four or five flavors, then this has got good complexity. So I think when I look at Mr. Malone's rosé here, I would say this is very good. I don't think it's outstanding because it's probably a little bit flaky, um, perhaps on the um, intensity, but it was balanced. It had good length and it was complex. So three out of four tells me this is a very good wine and that's your quality. And that's how you do it. It sounds so mathematical in a way, but you can't sit there and go, I like this wine, it's nice. You have to be able to have a little kind of um, rubric in your head that helps you understand that a little bit more. So not bad at all. I'm in, I hope some of you are writing in the, asking questions or putting in the chat some of the things that you're tasting. Um, one of the things that you perhaps have noticed with the Provence style wines is they're very light. They're very easy to drink and sometimes not requiring any analysis whatsoever. They're deck wines. You sit out there half past six at night and just listen to the birds and have a nice glass of rosé. I'm not going to go through the systematic head to toe with the, um, with my second wine here but you can see here with a more a different style of production and Spain this is actually from um, Rioja um, again inland can be very very hot but this is um, certainly um, Alavesa it's a little bit elevated different style of winemaking different grapes this is Tempranillo um, and Grenache whereas um, over here um, you know we're seeing the typical um, Grenache, saint blend that we see in the south of France. But when you're actually um, tasting these particular um, rosés tonight, you know, I want you to sort of think about comparing them and, and maybe seeing the differences in them. So for this one, completely different nose. Um, this one just smells, I mean, this actually has like black fruit aromas. It has strawberries. But honestly, you can smell like black currants and black berries in it. So completely different. And tasting it, a little bit more, wow, alcohol. That's one thing I didn't really mention. Boy, oh boy. So alcohol will tingle your nose and burn your throat. And this is burning my throat. And here's the problem. To me, that wine is out of a little bit out of balance because I don't know about you, but I tried wines that are 14 and a half, 15, 16%. And the alcohol is masked. That, whew, that is really fiery. That's like kind of taking a shot of tequila. So hopefully that little quick tasting there has perhaps helped you um, understand how you sort of taste or go through any white, rosé or red. Um, and so what we'd like to do in the last part is involve you. So please put your cameras on and shout out some questions. Um, and we've got fabulous people there who are monitoring all the questions and they'll send them to me. I'm going to have to put my glasses on unless they're going to verbally tell me these questions. Hi, Sarah. I'll be the one to moderate all the questions. Okay. So we have a few. Um, one was just to revisit um, the Blick um, moniker so we can go over um, what those mean and just kind of how to approach them when you're drinking and tasting a wine. So yeah, so balance, length, intensity, and complexity. Balance is just the components in the wine all sort of working in harmony. Length is how long does it stay in your mouth, you know, after you've taken a sip. Intensity is how powerful are the aromas and flavors 
And then the complexity are those aromas and flavors. So if you just say it tastes of lemon, then that's a simple wine. But if you say this wine tastes of lemon, grapefruit, blah, 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 you write about four or five different things about it, then it's obviously going to be more complex. All those four things, if you can check every single one of those, those four things and say, yeah, it was balanced, it had great length, it was intense and it was complex, it's definitely at the spectrum of a very good to outstanding wine. If you go, unfortunately, and check just one box, yeah, it was, you know, let's say balanced, but nothing else was checked. You're probably looking at a very ordinary, acceptable wine. So that's how I use it. Great, thank you. So we have another question from your daughter, Tara. Actually. Oh. <laughs> um, what is a rosé you recommend for someone who wants something light? Yeah, I think she needs to kind of look for, um, you know, she, she lives in uh, Europe and they have great access to a lot of these very, very pale um, rosés. Um, and the Provence rosés, you know, these certainly from the south of France are very easy to drink. In, if she, you know, this is what she's probably going to come across in Europe more than, than here. Great. Um, Kurt wants to know, is a Sancerre rosé an actual rosé? Sanso. S-A-N-C-E-R-R-E. Sancerre. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Sancerre um, up in the Loire Valley um, is very, very famous for making um, a white out of Sauvignon Blanc. But what a lot of people don't know is they make Sancerre rosé, absolutely. And they make red. Um, and they, they certainly, they use um, a few different grapes, but Pinot Noir tends to be the one that you see quite a lot up there being used in Rosé Sancerre. Great. Um, so Caroline would like to know, can you pair the same kinds of cheeses to, rose, to all rosé wines? You know, I think rosé is probably one of the most food friendly wines out there because one of the things you haven't got is tannin. And when you do food and wine pairing, tannin is the beast. Tannin is that um, mouth drying sensation you get with red wine. And unfortunately, um, it just makes things go completely crazy. So for example, if you had a big powerful red with a piece of salmon, it can make your mouth taste metallic. Um, it, it really does some crazy things. So um, if you can stay away from that tannin, but you're not really a white wine drinker, rosé is definitely the intermediary. Um, and you can certainly, if you want something a bit more powerful, um, you know, you can see, go to the sort of hotter climates. Come to California. The California rosés are phenomenal. Um, New Zealand makes great, powerful rosés. Australia does. Um, look for the hotter parts of the world, um, and you're going to find that the grapes are riper, and the wine is going to have more power. Great. Taylor would like to know, how much money would you spend on a bottle of wine, and which type would you spend more on? Okay, so um, I'm, you know, my colleague and I, Catherine Rabb, we always have this like challenge to find great wines under $10. Um, I think, you know, this one was $4.99. <laughs> you know, um, there's nothing wrong with going into Trader Joe's or some of the shops that have really, you know, buy bulk, like that can get very affordable wine prices. Um, but they are what they are. So for my price point, um, I usually do, you know, spend probably around the $10 mark. But I'm really, um, I love trying anything. You just give me any rosé. I mean, these are wines that I'm using in class and I've got stuff from the Savoir, I've got from Italy. You know, I, I, I love just looking. There's a fabulous book. It's only $10 on Amazon and it's um, Elizabeth Gaby and it's just called Rosé Wine. And she, every single thing you need to know about rosé is in that book. Um, and, and her webinar was one I went to last week, just trying to get myself primed for tonight. Um, what was the second part to that question? It was what, what would I buy, what type? What would you spend more on? As in what type of rosé? I think I would spend certainly more on something very unique. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind, like this was probably a little bit more expensive, but you know, I wanted to try it, see how it was. Um, I like Charles Smith in um, Washington State. You know, I just love trying different things, but about $10, $12, I start to feel a bit sick when it gets to 15. <laughs> Awesome. So one question from Pia was, any recommendations for rosé for, with spicier cuisine? Oh, yeah, definitely. So one of the good things about rosé, uh, or if any of you eat spicy food, um, is that you want some sort of residual sugar. I don't like sweet wine. Um, 
you know, but I do, I don't mind if it's sort of at medium. Um, so you're talking about maybe 12 grams a liter um, of sugar. And so some that I really think are great are the Loire Valley in France. Northern um, France has great. They've always made these wines historically, you can go back hundreds of years, and they've always had them with more residual sugar than anywhere else on the planet. Don't forget as well, a wine that gets really dissed is Zinvandel. You know, it's Beringer did the damage because it was bulk, you know, and this, this blush name that they created. But some of our rosés here in, you know, the United States, in California, and um, they certainly have more residual sugar um, than anywhere else. And those are really super with spicy. What the sugar does is it calms the spice down. Unfortunately, going back to our little enemy, tannin, if you actually are eating something really fiery and you have a glass of Cabernet Sauvignon that's so tannic, that will make the spice go through the roof. The only thing that calms spice down is sweetness. So that's why rosés, the little bit more lusher, fruity ones, are the best. Great. Um, so we have some conversation about the glass corks and how that <laughs> relates to the bottle of wine. And I don't know if you can speak to that um, as they are becoming more popular. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, um, real cork is very, very good for wines that you're going to age because it allows that sort of breathing, the wine can breathe. Um, but if you're looking at wine that's typically going to be drank within, you know, 24 hours or a week or a month or a year, then screw cap is perfectly fine. It's not because of cork taint, because cork taint has pretty much been abolished now. Um, but some of these, you know, the synthetic corks give a lot of people headaches because their cork gets, their, their little worm on their corkscrew gets broken. Um, and these, yeah, you see these quite a lot now. These, um, they're kind of cute. It's, it's a really nice little marketing gimmick. There's so many studies out there um, about, you know, what does this do to the wine? Um, but to be perfectly honest, there's, we've got so much technology now with our closures that we very rarely, um, nothing really can do too much damage anymore. But I am seeing a lot more of these. Oops. And they don't break, so that's perfect. Totally didn't break. <laughs> um, so Marissa would like to know, how does Tavel I don't know if I'm saying that right, differ from other rosés? Yeah, I mean, Tavel is from the southern part of Rome. And this particular wine has been made for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and what they do is um, they, they use so many different grapes in the blend. Um, it's, there's two areas, Tavel and um, Lurac, and they both pull a lot of those southern Rhone grapes in. So you get a lot of Syrah, more Verdure, Grenache, saint -So. They also use a lot of Bourbonlanc and a grape called Claret, and um, they also use Grenache, uh, because a Grenache can come in sort of, you know, three different sort of shades, if you like. Um, so they're very into blending, but what they've also done is they do a long, long maceration. They really make these wines. Uh, it, the only way I can describe it is they kind of treat them like this wine is going to be a red wine. But clearly, you know, they pull out those skins a little earlier um, so that they can, um, you know, they're not, they're not getting a very a red wine per se, but it's a very complex and rich rosé. Um, which I absolutely love. So they, just imagine they're making red wine, but they bleed the whole thing off. It's like total saigné. It's not like I'm taking a little bit off to make rosé and the rest can make red. They, they do the whole process of saigné. Um, and it's beautiful. It's, it, what you're going to find is it's high alcohol because you've got Grenache and that grape is, a, is just one of those grapes that ripen so well. You get high levels of sugar and it, it just produces these massive alcoholic you know, high alcohol driven wines, but again, beautifully made. So the alcohol is totally integrated. Um, but the Southern Rhone is, is phenomenal for rosés. You just have to be careful because I, I know some of you go to Trader Joe's, there's that particular brand La Vieux Femme, and it's a very inexpensive wine and they have red, white and rosé. Well, that's not, that's sort of a bulk wine from the Rhone. But if you focus on Taval and Lerac um, and go down into the sort of Provence area, you get, you get great rosés. Great. So we have a lot of questions still in the queue that I want to mention. If you answer, if your question doesn't get answered here, we are going to follow up with you after. Um, but Sarah, one last question that a few people have mentioned about California. Mm -hmm. uh, what regions of California do you feel have the best rosé? 
So I think if you're looking at um, the rosés, again, we're so fortunate with California and it's so big. I mean, first, you know, when I first came to the United States, I went to Napa, you know, and Sonoma. And of course, that's very, you know, big time um, Cabernets and Pinots. Um, but as I kind of kept going back to California, um, I really started to fall in love with, you know, the Central Coast. Um, my colleague, Mark, we went um, last year with, with a couple of people from Providence and we just explored the most amazing wines um, in the sort of Central Coast area. Um, and, you know, some of them um, are just absolutely fantastic. And the, so many people go, oh, California is so hot. It is hot. But the other thing is you go inland and you've got coastal ranges, you've got mountain ranges where the vines are elevated. Um, you've got the Pacific that's pumping in cooler air. So, um, you know, I've, I've, I've tried so many different um, California rosés. I love them, especially, I know I sound like a wimp, but I love Pinot Noir. Um, so anything that's sort of Pinot Noir driven rosé, sign me up. Those, that's my favorite. Absolutely love it. Great. So I think we do have time for one more. Mm -hmm. um, food pairings has come up a lot as well. Um, what foods do you suggest to be paired with rosé? Um, seafood or any generic food pairings that you can describe? Yeah, I, I think personally with rosés, they're so friendly. Um, uh, we do a lot of barbecuing down here in the south. We um, And again, there's some fabulous wines with just a little bit more sugar in there that helps sort of balance out with the barbecue. Um, fish is fantastic, especially salmon. You know, sometimes with the oily fish like mackerel or tuna or salmon, oil is a, is a real difficult one with wine. Uh, whites don't seem to be powerful enough sometimes unless you choose the right one. Reds have got that tannin that can make that oil, make your mouth taste a little bit like you're chomping on aluminum, aluminum foil. Um, and so really what you're looking for, you know, I think with those oily fish is, is any of these rosés would be fantastic. You kind of have to think about the weight of the food. And I know there's Peter Reinhardt's here and I've got some chefs that are online and things. They're probably, um, you know, so much more talented at food and wine pairing than me. But I think you've really got to look at the sort of contrasting flavors in the food and the wine. Um, the weight is hugely important. You can't have a little wimpy Pinot Brigio if you're going to do some like real fabulous, you know, um, chicken breast that's covered in a multitude of different flavors or cooked a certain way. So it's about the ingredients and it's about how you cook it um, that definitely feed back into the wine that you actually choose. But let me just, you know, not knock, knock this on the head. You do not need to eat. Okay, this is a wine you can just drink. And there's not, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with just sitting in your deck chair with this and some olives. That'd be nice. Put your feet up, don't cook. <laughs> Especially in this heat, absolutely don't. Oh my God, absolutely. This is definitely a pre-dinner, during dinner, après dinner wine. Wonderful, well, thank you for answering the questions of the presentation. I'm gonna turn it over to Lori. No but like problem. you said, any questions that weren't answered, we will follow up with you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody. It's so nice. I'll look back and see who's signed and everything. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Professor Thank you, thank thank you, you so much you. for leading us on tonight's tasting experience with Rosé. It was such an informative and interesting discussion. Thank we are you. grateful that you shared your time with us this evening and appreciate your insight on this wine variety. Your love for Jaywoo and passion for wine education is so appreciated. We'd also like to thank all of our alumni attendees for joining us today. It was great to see you all. We welcome a nice rosé break after all the difficulties we've faced this year so far. Believe it or not, another academic year is nearly upon us and students will begin uh, returning to class in just a few short weeks for the start of the fall semester. Much will be different, but the value of Jaywoo's experiential education will always remain the same. In the College of Hospitality Management, our faculty pride themselves on providing students with portable skills that can be applied to any sector of the hospitality industry or other industries, which is so important during times like these. If you're in a position to give back, please consider a gift directly to the College of Hospitality Management to help Professor Malik and her colleagues continue to prepare the next generation of hospitality leaders. We've shared the link in the chat window and I thank you so much for your generosity. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed this evening's session, 10 Things You Didn't Know About Rosé, part of the JWU for You family of programming. Through JWU for You, alumni can engage in informative and interesting discussions related to professional development, 
social and avid, avid interest topics for the full listing of upcoming events, please visit our events calendar at alumni.jwu.edu. We appreciate your attendance and wish you a wonderful night. Thank you so much for joining us.